Welcome to the show. I'm Jim Flyzik. During today's show, we will discuss progress being made with cloud computing at the Department of Defense. With me today on the show are Frank Konechny, the Chief Technology Officer of the U.S. Air Force, John Hale, the Chief DISA Cloud Portfolio, Colonel Rodney Swan, Chief Enterprise Architect Division, Acting Chief Land War Net Architecture Integration Division, U.S. Army, CIO G6, and I'm told the Cloud Trail Boss. The uh, Stacy Wynn, the senior federal manager at Forcepoint, AJ Laforti, uh, the solutions engineer, BMC Software, and Doug Boudois, the director of Deloitte Consulting. We're talking cloud computing at defense. Let's start with John Hale at DISA. John, tell us about some progress you see being made uh, with cloud computing over at DISA. <clears throat> so, good afternoon. Thank, thanks for having us sure. on, Jim. Um, so, you know, I will say that from a DISA perspective, we, we've been looking at cloud for quite a while. We've been looking at it in a pretty expansive way with our DOD mission partners. Um, you know, the, the biggest success that we've had recently has been uh, Collaboration Pathfinder, an effort that we're doing. It's a joint venture between the Air Force and DLA where we're uh, helping them migrate on to a commercial software as a service office automation suite uh, that provides calendaring and, and email and, and uh, collaboration capabilities and those kind of things. Um, and, and working through all the process of getting that done in a safe and secure manner, leveraging uh, commercial capabilities. That's really the, been the biggest success we've had going so far. So. Yeah, terrific. I know it's, uh, we've been doing this now for, for, for multiple years, and uh, the, the way watching the way cloud has evolved, it's uh, really been exciting for me just uh, watching the, the, the evolution of all this. Frank, what's happening over there at Air Force? What are you guys doing with, uh, well, in the cloud as, world? As we started looking at all the applications we had, we decided that we had to auto-provision those into the cloud. We could not actually manually move everything that we had to do, so mm -hmm. we are developing an auto-provisioning capability right now that will allow us to move into uh, any of the clouds, the commercial clouds as well as into the mill clouds, mill cloud one, one cloud two, and whatever is coming out next. We also have been working now with uh, determining what the CSSP requirements, that's the defense requirements mm -hmm. for the applications, okay. because this has come out with some, and we were trying to figure out how we were going to actually implement those in the Air Force itself as opposed to using DISA. We can use DISA now as a, as a service offering, but we're trying to figure out how is the best use of that, especially when we determine that we have to put in you know, hundreds of applications in a particular cloud provider. Sure. How are we going to defend sure. 100 applications in a particular cloud as opposed to just one, which is kind of like, when we all look at it, they say, oh, one is easy, you know, that's what I always think my model is going to be, but then we say, well, we have hundreds, you know, just yeah, right. beyond that point. Right. And so we're trying to figure that as well as going into, you know, different software as a service offerings. Very cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm reading a lot about cloud. I'm a lot about security in the cloud too. About a lot of new things coming down the road about uh, you know security products in the cloud and so forth, and where that's going to go as the next generation and so forth. Uh, AJ Laforti at BMC. How's BMC positioned, and how are you guys supporting your customers and your uh, DoD customers as they move towards cloud? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're, we're at the current time we're helping our customers a lot because the technology is expanding from what they're using. Uh, right now they're uh, have a few providers, but they're actually starting to add more, more mill providers, more technologies, more capabilities behind the scenes mm -hmm. to host the applications that they're utilizing within DoD. And we're actually helping them a lot in securing these applications and ensuring that when I provision or when I require a resource, that I can ensure no matter where it's provisioned, that that resource is secure, that it will meet the stage, it will meet the requirements, it will be push, put in a place that it is ensured to be secure day one and day 365 as we're moving forward. Yeah, that's an interesting question. We've had a lot of good discussion over the years about cloud and the security and the service level agreements and the shared responsibilities now between the contractors and government. And, 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 um, and, I, and I guess the thing that resonates with me a lot is it's an opportunity to take a look, a holistic approach at what you have with security and really refocus on where you've been. Because we, in my opinion, we've been band-aiding security for years and years and years and years and years. And now we have a chance to look at it more holistically. Uh, Colonel Swan, um, how about over the Army? Tell us uh, about some progress being made with cloud computing uh, at the Army. Sure. Uh, first, let me say uh, thank you for inviting Thanks the for Army to the panel. We, we really enjoy being here and, and uh, you know, talking about the good things that are going on in the Army. Uh, we have similar uh, activities going on that the other panelists had mentioned, but I want to talk about a couple of things specifically that we have done, I believe, to kind of drive us to that cloud environment. 
And, uh, and it, from a contractor's per, contract perspective, we've done a couple of things. One is we've released the uh, Army on-premise private cloud contract uh, at Redstone Arsenal. So that okay. was an effort that we started about a year or so ago, and and that was the that was the that's going to be the first instantiation of an on-prem private cloud service uh you know within the army environment very cool and so we're going to use leverage that in lessons learned in terms of how do we influence uh how the army goes to the cloud in the future so so that's going to be used we're going to take lessons okay. learned from that we're going to basically replicate that uh three other times at uh, some other enduring data centers and uh, we also released an RFP that uh, closed on uh, 7 October for the Army Cloud Computing Enterprise Transition Contract, or the Accent Contract. And uh, so we're trying to shape that contract in being one of the, uh, the uh, uh, basic ordering agreements contracts for the Army so that you, uh, mission owners can come and use that to provision cloud services. Uh, so those are the things that we're doing on the contract side. But, but the goal for the Army right now is really to begin to develop velocity for application mm -hmm. migration, right? Right. Because we uh, in the Army are participating, obviously, in the DOD's Army sure. Data Center Consolidation Program. So sure. we've got to close data centers. And we know that there are applications out there that have to have a place to go. So as we begin to do that, we've got to create this, this runway so that these applications have a place to go. And this is all part of that effort. Security is absolutely one of the chief absolutely. concerns. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's funny because we do shows on data center consolidation too, and it gets to where it's getting hard anymore to talk about data center consolidation and not talk about cloud and the same thing because, you know, they're, they're, they're so interrelated these days. Doug Bourgeois, how about the, at Deloitte? Uh, how is Deloitte positioned in, uh, to be supporting this move to cloud that's happening across the DoD? Well, first, Jim, thanks for having me on the panel. It's sure. a real pleasure to be here with such a distinguished uh, group of panel members, so I certainly appreciate that. Uh, Deloitte is helping our clients across uh, all government sectors, but uh, specifically um, in DOD. Actually, it's first uh, probably important to note that we're seeing um, cloud computing from a market standpoint is a major inflection point right now, right? So uh, government agencies are no longer thinking about the cloud tactically as a place for office automation tools and for public facing websites. It's actually uh, becoming a key part of a strategy of rethinking the uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So if that's one thing that we're helping our, our clients do is rethink the infrastructure, the approach there. Uh, government agencies and several in DOD, I'll, I'll point out in just a second, are basically <coughs> no longer you know wanting to hold on to the management and the ownership of, uh, of the actual infrastructure. Uh, second is um, recognizing that shift. Uh, government agencies and DOD is, is, is definitely doing this, is taking more of a portfolio approach. In other words, not looking at, uh, at, at applications and the data associated with them as point solutions. Instead, looking at it again, I'm rethinking the infrastructure, let's go ahead and move these applications over from a broader scale perspective. And in order to do that, it takes a rather thorough and comprehensive kind of an engineering assessment and security assessment associated with those. And so we're helping both the Army and the Navy right now through those kind of comprehensive portfolio based based analysis for um, basically disposition or readiness for cloud. Yeah, From you know, I like that. You know, that's the other thing that I think cloud has forced agencies to do is to really take a look at your portfolio of everything you have. And I, and I don't know this for a fact, but I, I would predict a lot of agencies are discovering things that they really don't need anymore. I mean, things have been around for a long time and saying, no, why we have this? and learning ways to reinvent some of those things and modernize things. So uh, there are th those type of advantages, I think, are sort of like um, coming out as, as this process moves on. Uh, Stacy Wynn, tell us about ForcePoint, how ForcePoint supports uh, cloud pro programs and the movement to cloud and customers that are working some of these issues. Well, thank you for having us. Um, nice to be on a panel with all of you. Uh, just to echo exactly what you're saying, uh, this modernization is so important for all of us. It's like moving house, right? You get to go through everything and kind of throw out what you don't want and keep what's really important. So that move to cloud is really supporting that. And at Forcepoint, we are looking to be able to help our government partners through that whole journey. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to just necessarily jump all of your classified systems right to a cloud. That's a migration path. It may be hybrid. It may be on-prem, as the Colonel was talking about. Mm -hmm but still in a cloud architecture. So Forcepoint Solutions will help you get there. Yeah, excellent. Well. You know, and I was reading where OMB is pushing for uh, modernization programs. Uh, we'll see how 
how if it changes with administration changes that are coming down the road. But uh, I know OMB looking for agencies to you know come up with longer term plans on how they can do their IT modernization. I'm sure cloud and some of the points you're bringing up will be uh, major factors that'll be addressed there. Uh, let's talk. A lot of times our audience likes to hear about a, a specific program, Colonel Colonel Swan. If I asked you. Identify like a specific program would be that first one you uh, referenced um, as uh, one you'd point to that you believe is a, a success in making a big difference uh, by going to the cloud. Well, certainly the uh, the contract action was a big success, right? So now we have a contract in place that's going to help influence the on-prem cloud and, and even the off-prem. But I think the key one for the Army would be the, the logistics support activity that, okay. that we have uh, at Redstone Arsenal, which is a, uh, is a infrastructure as a service model and it, it provides services to the Army. And uh, again, that has been in place for quite a while. Uh, it um, is something that we're gaining lessons learned mm -hmm. and so as we go throughout the process so we take the 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 uh, APC award that we did at Redstone and we couple that with what's going on with LOGSA uh, at that location then we, we begin to develop a holistic approach yeah and absolutely discovery is one of those things right we got to know where we are we got to know the as is before we can get to the to be right and so uh, so through those programs we're leveraging all the lessons learned and and applying that as we go in an iterative approach to how we get to the cloud in the cool. Army. Well, I'm going to come back and hit you with lessons learned here in a few minutes because it's always valuable to our listening audience to hear about the lessons you're learning so that they can uh, you know, learn from you in terms of the things to do or maybe things not to do. Uh, John Hale, what do you think in terms of I ask you to identify like a specific program you think is making a difference and actually by going to cloud it's going to be a big improvement at DISA? So I will, I will say I, I don't think it's any one particular program. You know, we approach cloud or compute in general as a three-prong approach. You know, traditional compute's going to go forward, right? We're still going to have things that we need to run in our data centers that can't go to the cloud. So that's something that we have to deal with going forward, and, and, and we have plans and models to how to do that. But then we also we talked a little bit about on-prem cloud capabilities, and we see that as a big a big capability for the DoD going forward on-prem private clouds for for housing that cloud data that we don't necessarily feel comfortable moving it to an off-prem capability yet. Uh, and then the third leg of that is the off-prem commercial cloud capability, which is where we see the biggest bang for the buck going forward from a department perspective. And that's where we see a lot of workload moving out to the off-prem commercial cloud capabilities and really free freeing up that vital floor space in our in our core data centers mm -hmm. uh, so that we can put more mission mission data in there. Right. Uh, and so, you know, those three things all working together uh, are, are kind of the key initiatives that we see going forward to help compute overall within the department. Yeah, and so. that last point you made is my point I made earlier about data center consolidation and cloud overlapping, making additional room for more consolidation. Uh, Frank Konechny, what do you think, uh, if I asked you, to point out a program that you think cloud's going to make a difference and it's going to make uh, improvements at the Air Force. I've got two today. Okay. <laughs> the, uh, uh, John's already ta taking collaboration pathfinder, but we have another software as a service application as well. This is Milpers, which you, everybody doesn't realize is that uh, all the personnel, one of the personnel systems is basically sitting in a, in a commercial cloud right now. In fact, we switched it so fast that nobody knew that it was actually switched. No, that's pretty cool. So everybody in the Air Force is actually on this system now. And it's interesting because uh, it has better security than we thought we'd have before. In fact, we've had no incidents whatsoever. We've had uh, better response times with the vendor than we thought we were going to have. So it's, been a, it's a, been a great success story for moving things to a cloud. In fact, they're doing updates now in, in place without actually putting down the system or anything. So this is one of those great stories that say, yes, everything's working fine and we hope it continues to work. Yeah. <laughs> because I think we're going to do a lot more software as a service capabilities well, to do that. Well, I think so too. And, um, you know, I've made this point many, many times when the next generation uh, workforce enters the workforce, they're going to expect software as a service and uh, there's going to be an app for everything, you know. I mean, <laughs> so we'll see where all that goes. Um, Doug Bourgeois, what do you think in terms if I asked you to take a look around government and can you identify a program out there that you think would be one that um, uh, you would hold up as being something that's making a difference? I definitely can and I can, you know, somewhat uh, confirm or affirm, you know, Frank's comments around Millpers and I think 
um, that's indicative of a, of a broader trend across DOD specifically right now, which is, um, again, going from tactical solutions to more strategic, the shift in the acceptance of human capital type of information going to the cloud as opposed to just basic public information. So again, part of that inflection point I was talking about earlier. So we see that program kind of leading the way with a SaaS perspective, um, which you know also addressed, I think you talked about the security um, requirements associated with that, but also drove not only to a SaaS model, which is, uh, you know, allows the shifting of resources to more mission-oriented type activities, uh, but in particular, the user experience itself being addressed and, you know, providing a more richer experience. It's more consistent, modernized with what people do in their personal lives, whether they're banking or doing other things. Um, so that's also now shifting over that idea, that kind of strategy to the Navy. Uh, the Navy's embarking on a similar strategy. So an example where program leading the way, another program with a similar mission, heading down the same path. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would also say probably the D6 program in the Air Force, uh, one of the first programs of record to really recognize the strategic importance of applications and the role of cloud platforms mm -hmm. and, and modernizing and transforming those applications to take full advantage of what cloud capability can, can, give, or the, can give, the agility, uh, the speed, uh, the rapid delivery, uh, as well as the cost uh, benefits of going to the cloud. So I think that's also a leading edge example of kind of where the trends are headed. Very cool, very cool. I'll tell you, boy, this has come a long way. We've been doing the show now 11 years, and when we first started talking cloud way back when, I mean, you know, people were you know, first just thinking about it, this, that, and the other thing, and now we hear story after story after story of all these things that are happening and things moving, and it's uh, it really has uh, become become real, I guess, is the way to, to, to phrase that. Uh, Stacey Wynn, what do you think? If I asked you to look across government and point at something you think is an uh, interesting story about cloud computing that you see as something that you'd point to as showing where it's really making a difference. Anything come to mind? One of the, <clears throat> pardon me, one of the programs that we are watching is a mission partner environment. Um, really excited about what that program is going to be able to take and leverage from all of the successes that we've had so far to then build in our information sharing with coalition partners because as we know we never go anywhere alone so that's going to be one that we're really watching and are very excited about the security we can bring to that specific environment of sharing across not just our entities but also with our partners. Yeah it's interesting too how um, you know you, if you look down the road well you know agent agencies building their own cloud, then we'll DISA will this will be supporting multiple military establishments. Will GSA expand to support uh, multiple civilian? Where's that all going to go down the road? I'm sure a lot of interesting culture issues coming down the, ra down the road. Uh, AJ Laforte, what do you think in terms of I asked you to uh, look across government? Is there, is there a specific example of a program you think uh, is making a, a real difference and going to make a real difference? Yeah, absolutely. There's, um, without a naming any specific programs, there's a few that we're working on and assisting uh, uh, with different customers and really w the interesting thing is with implementing a management layer for their cloud being able to provide services to the people that need them and providing them extremely fast. Mm -hmm. uh, with one of our customers recently we actually found that the provisioning process was too fast. Too uh, fast. Too fast. Uh, consumers were able to actually provision and request and get resources so quickly they actually started over provisioning because they were afraid the process was going to go away. Oh, wow. So the ability to be able to provide the services to the consumer to where they know they can cons consistently request them and they're not going to have to hoard them or request extra services or get them ahead of time <laughs> because they're always going to be available and that's yeah. really what the cloud's about is providing these services um, as quickly as possible so that way the, the folks that need them, the application owners, the development owners, etc., can do what they need to do when they need to do I it. I love that. I mean, how often do you hear people saying, hey, IT people, slow down. You know, you're going too fast when you quit with this uh, program. Uh, I want to hear about the lessons you're learning and, and, and start uh, discussing that, but first we need to take a short break. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. I'm Jim Isaac here with Frank Konechny from the U.S. Air Force, John Hale from DISA, Colonel Rodney Swan from the U.S. Army, Stacy Wynn from Force Point, A.J. Laforte from BMC Software, and Doug Bourgeois from Deloitte Consulting. We're talking defense cloud. We've talked about progress. We've talked about some sp specific programs. Let's talk about some lessons that you guys are learning along the way. We, we always like to have that for our listening audience and your colleagues so they can hear some of the things you're, you need to address and perhaps 
help them along as they, they work through these programs. Let's start with Frank Konechny this time. Uh, Frank, what are some of the lessons you're learning along the way as you, you move to cloud computing? Well, I think the first thing you have to learn is that you have to figure out what your inventory of applications are. I mean, this has been one of the issues, and as we in the Air Force, we have lots of bases. We have to go to every base to figure out what's actually there. And we find, of course, there's some duplicate stuff which has to be rationalized out. But then again, when you look at the duplicative stuff, and when we start talking about migration to a cloud, we have to do some engineering analysis. And this has been the, the keystone of what we have to do. Because you just can't move something to a cloud without looking at, is it ready to move to a cloud? Do I have to totally modify that system? Do I have to know all the interfaces that are associated with it? Because some of those interfaces may be to other systems, and therefore, if they're in other systems and other clouds, you're going to pay a penalty for, for delays as well as in com costs when you start moving things between sure. clouds. Sure. And so people have to understand that. But then, as we do the cost model and we do the mission analysis model, the question is, where is the, where is the user base sitting, part of this engineering analysis? What is their effect? And, and, and the big thing is, uh, do I have to move it at some point in time to another cloud because of a threat vector? Mm -hmm. Now, on top of all that, we've, we've now determined that we need to look at the DevOps model. Because we thought we, you know, we, it's this easy to say, oh, I'm going to migrate things. Yeah, well, right. not, not easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, yeah, you don't want to just move things over old right. stuff. You'd and like to modernize along the way. And some people just want to move stuff. Yeah. And, you know, we started talking about containers now and to should we be using containers or should we not? Mm -hmm. And if you start using containers, you really will change the DevOps model across the board. And so there's a question of, well, is this migration going to change how we actually move and do development efforts? Mm -hmm. And then how fast can we move? And as AJ said, provisioning is fast. Yeah. So provisioning-wise for, an a, for a, a DevOps model means I put it out there, I, I do development in the same area, I test it, and then all of a sudden I push it to production. These guys aren't used to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we just did a program on uh, DevOps and containerization. It was very, very interesting hearing, you know, the changes there. And it's, it's, it's funny how all these programs sort of blend together and they're starting to over, you know, where you can't talk about one subject where you don't actually, you know, drift off into, into the others. Uh, John Hale, what do you think in terms of some lessons learned? What, uh, what are you learning along the way here? Well, so you, you've heard it from multiple panel members. You know, number one is lift and shift is not an option right so you know when you go when you start to looking at your capabilities and moving it to the yeah, cloud let's environment, move this old stuff into another you know, place lift and shift is not the answer and I'll tell you that from a from a DOD perspective we initially looked at cloud as a as a cost savings factor and the idea was we would simply lift and shift our stuff to the cloud and magically save money right and you know it doesn't really work like that so the rationalization that Frank talked about is key uh, you know and then moving the essential stuff to the cloud and more importantly making sure that it's designed and built in the cloud environment and you're not shifting old school technology uh, you know we've talked a lot about security right Se security is the kind of the, the 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 number one thing when we talk to DOD mission partners mm -hmm. about why they haven't moved more and more workload to the commercial cloud or to the cloud environment right. at all and it's that security issue right so when they move into a traditional data center into a traditional server they get a certain set of security services that are provided inherently as part of that when they move to the cloud, they don't necessarily get that stuff. And so there's some consternation there, mostly amongst the approving authorities, about giving ATOs for things that are moving into right. the cloud. So we put a lot of things in place uh, with the, in the, from a DoD perspective to make sure that the security capabilities are there uh, so that people can safely and securely move their workloads to commercial cloud. So those are kind of the two big ones, yeah. right? Really, you know, don't lift and shift and, and the focus like on that. security. I like that, don't lift and shift. I'll, I'll plagiarize that for several shows in the future. <laughs> the uh, Colonel Swan, what do you think in terms of some lessons learned? What, what, what uh, would you pass on some wisdom as some things you're learning through the process that you think are, are worth noting? Absolutely. Well, I think uh, one of the things that, that we're learning in the Army is that the culture is still changing. Mm -hmm. We still have, and the, but, but the more successful we become, the faster that culture will change. So, you know, we owe it to, the, to the, our mission owners to prove that we can do it. And then another lesson we learned is that modernization doesn't just happen. It has to be programmed. And so we got to be able to have some forethought about our modernization, modernization efforts and how we do that. So that has to be programmed within the acquisition lifecycle of, 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 the, of the Army and, and what we're doing. And then the, the other lesson that we learn, we're learning is that cloud is not the answer for all IT hosting. There mm -hmm. are some applications that 
due to legacy uh, environments, due to the cost of modernization, you know, we have to decide what where do we want to put that those applications and so uh, so we, we we've learned that and then we've also learned that um, that the larger the community the bigger the benefits in terms of uh, volume discounts and so that's why we really want to get to the commercial cloud environment because we know that if we go to the commercial cloud environment uh, the, the the price points are somewhat lower than if we do strictly an on-prem. There will always be an on-prem. We always are gonna, are gonna have a need for an on-prem. But as we build our applications in the future, right, and we do that modernization, and we take a program, pro programmatic look and approach to that, then we're able to uh, pr uh, plan how we're gonna mo modernize and, and migrate to the off-prem cloud. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Stacy Wynn, what do you think if uh, I asked you for some lessons you're learning along the way or, or Forcepoint is seeing things, uh, what are some of the things that pop out as uh, uh, things that you'd pass on to others as be, be aware of this if you're moving to a cloud? I think the, the most important thing is, as John Hale mentioned, security is always integral to anything that we're, we're doing, especially in the government, and we're protecting national security and all of those good things. So we have to keep that in the forefront. And it's up to us as vendors to make that as easy as possible for our government partners, and also to make sure that our security is supporting the mission, that we aren't making things so hard that everybody works around it. So, And that doesn't go away in the cloud environment. That becomes even more important. So we, we need to be able to guide very efficiently and effectively our government partners. I love and that security supporting the mission, you know, because there's been for so long people looking at security as something that, you know, is is hard to justify, hard to do ROI, hard to whatever. Right. But what we're learning today is if you want to be seen as a trusted organization and you want to people believing in your organization, you better have good security in place. If not, you can uh, you can take some big hits real fast. Uh, AJ Laforty, what do you think in terms of some lessons you're learning along the way here as you're supporting your customer base? Yeah. Actually, I'd like to expand on what, what, what both Frank and John have already okay. mentioned. Is a lot of that stuff that we've, already, we've learned ourselves is as you're moving things to the cloud and you're provisioning uh, items within the cloud, understanding the application and the service and who the owner of that is. Being able to have some sort of configuration management database. Being able to, at a moment's notice, say, who owns this, what's it used for, and who's paying for it. And then understanding if it's over provisioned and then scalability um, a lot of apps inside the DOD don't need to be provisioned out at a large scale except maybe between the hours of nine to five and being able to auto scale up and auto scale down to be able to save the government cost in that manner mm -hmm. then the other thing is well, on the security side we've learned a lot as far as who owns the security um, so at BMC we provide that management layer but then it's a matter of, are we going to enable the end user who's consuming services in the cloud to handle security themselves, or do we want to enforce security from a top-down approach? So it's really a matter of which way does each individual agency within the DOD want to provide security on the systems that they're provisioning and maintaining within the cloud. They're a great point. All great points. Um, I used to always think, you know, if something bad happens in this application, who's going to be the one that goes up to Congress to testify as to why that bad thing happened? <laughs> um, because if, if it's you, you own it. <laughs> uh, Doug Bourgeois, what do you think are some of the lessons you're learning along the way here? Well, at Deloitte, our view is across the DOD as well as the other sectors of government. Sure. So our um, our view is, uh, is is based on the commonalities across them. So first, uh, cloud is about the mission and not about technology, which means uh, cloud needs to be viewed as a as basically an enabler of mission objectives and not just cost savings. And I think we've heard some of those sentiments echoed um, previously, which also implies that um, culture is maybe the toughest element. Uh, of a cloud migration or, or transformation and then organizational change needs to be considered as well. Uh, another one is right size your cloud. So I think the early phase cloud migrations um, were lift and shift as an approach and that's not an optimal, that's not an approach that, that, that provides an optimal approach to efficiency for cloud computing. So what we've done is we've created a cloud sprawl mm -hmm. analogous to the client server sprawl of the 80s and 90s and there's an opportunity to optimize either during or immediately post a, a cloud uh, migration. 
Uh, we're seeing a, an inflection point from cloud first to cloud native, which is kind of related to right size your cloud, which means don't just lift and shift, re-architect, modernize as you go. Uh, otherwise, you'll, um, you'll lose the efficiency gains that you have the potential to, to realize as also the, uh, lose the opportunity for agility gains. Uh, manage security at every step on the cloud journey. So many, many organizations are looking at security as a FedRAMP uh, check the box, mm -hmm. a point in time, assessment, review, uh, vulner vulnerability scans and all that. Um, and in particular, as, uh, as agencies start to modernize their applications, security needs to be designed in as they are, not just about replatforming, it's about reassessing the security profile of these applications as they go through the migration. And then finally, um, Shifting of the IT business model, and we haven't touched on that one yet. Uh, cloud computing, as we all know from the, the NIST definition of cloud, is a consumption-based model for IT. Uh, and there is a substantial cost management, cost transparency to, uh, capability there that's required to deliver on a consumption-based model that, that many organizations we see focus a little too much on the technology not enough on the shift in the business model required to support it. I love this stuff. That was great. Um, uh, I love all these anecdotes, man. See, people think I'm smart, but I'm re really, all I do is I get the stuff that you guys say, and then I reuse it down the road. People think I'm coming up with all this stuff myself, but this is good stuff, man. It's about the mission, not just the technology. You got to rate size the cloud. You got to shift the IT business model. Um, good stuff. I like that. Uh, let's talk about some tough things. Let's talk about challenges. What are some of the, the, the things that, uh, you know, you, the, the, those constraints you got to get over to get where you want to be. Let's start with you this time, John. John Hale at DISO. What are some of those things when you go get there and you're trying to make progress with cloud that but you, you got to get over this hurdle? Well, so we've talked to, we've talked to quite a bit about security, and I, right. I would say security is probably the number one hurdle that we face when we move more and more, and more workload to the cloud. Um, the other side of that is, is contracting, and so uh, Doug just touched on it a little bit. You know, Traditionally, in the DoD, we buy IT as if it's a weapon system, mm -hmm. and so uh, much like you would buy, you know, a, a tank or a, a ship or a plane or whatever, that's how we buy IT. And so it's, you know, it's 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 planned out for right. years, and it's money's palmed, and then it goes into an acquisition phase, and then you buy it, and by the time you buy it, it's outdated, and then you have right. to modernize it, and and so we're in this vicious cycle. And, and when we talk about cloud technology, we talk about you know, utility-based computing, where you buy what you want on demand mm -hmm. when you need it, um, and it and it's very fluid and, and very in and out. You know, based on mission demand. Sure. And I will tell you, from an acquisition side, our acquisition side is really struggling with how we transition Absolutely. to that model. Yeah, it's a to totally different so, model. I mean, you know, the service level agreements are totally different. Uh, the shared responsibilities are different. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, it's not same old, same old anymore. This is a new model. One of the things we're doing is we're working very closely with GSA on a new contract vehicle for the federal government overall called CAFE. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be, it's the cloud acquisition uh, mo uh, contract for the federal government. And so it's a new new vehicle that's, that's in development right now that will be coming out in the next year. But basically it's going to standardize a lot of the way that we purchase commercial cloud capabilities. So it's going to be a GSA vehicle where anybody in the in the federal government can go and purchase commercial cloud capabilities. And, and I think that's going to help standardize I a lot too. of that. I think that's a great stuff. idea, especially having DISA working with GSA. GSA, DISA for the DOD world, GSA for the civilian world, come out with some sort of models that work that you know other agencies can use rather than every agency try to, you know, create their own vehicles. Um, Colonel Swan, what do you think are some of the uh, constraints or some of the challenges you face as you try to move your programs towards a cloud environment? Well, I think uh, just to echo a lot of what we talked about here, we've talked a lot about security, we've talked a lot about contracting, and I think those are the two major areas. Yeah. I would say that within our within the Army right now, you know, resourcing and sustainment of that resourcing to do that modernization effort is has become a big concern of ours. Uh, and so how do we get after that? Because certainly we want to be able to have agility, you know, within the cloud. One of the great things about the cloud is it brings agility uh, to, to the uh, uh, to the mission owner. Uh, we obviously have to change our business processes, uh, as, as we had mentioned before. And uh, how do we get after that within the constraints that we have? And so we're working on that. Um, 
you know, trained personnel, personnel to be able to do the work. Right. So we have technicians today, but do they really understand what operating in the cloud means? And uh, how do we get after that? How do we get those trained personnel to good be point. able to do Very that work? And, and if you take a cyber guy, and it takes a while to grow one of those types of persons, sure. right? Uh, and you, you give him what he's doing today and you put him in a cloud environment, it's a whole new dynamic, yeah. right? And so uh, how they operate in the cloud is not the way they're going to operate on-prem. And, uh, and our, our on-prem instantiation that we have now at Redstone is a contract-owned, contract-operated uh, uh, contract and mm -hmm. that's how that's how it's formed so how do we get after that and then how do we standardize in the meantime right. and uh, it, it's sort of like uh, you know building the car while you're driving down the road right <laughs> and uh, it's very complex and uh, but but that's that's some of the constraints that we have but we're working through it as as John had said you know working with DOD working with uh, GSA and uh, and the provisional authorities and FedRAMP and you know trying to help influence right. how those processes work to, to build that agility excellent Frank uh, Konechny over at the Air Force what are some of the uh, challenges you see on a day-to-day -day basis that so, you, you, you know, need to overcome to get where you want to be talk about security let's not dwell on that one anymore, but we can come back to that later. The, uh, I think the problem we have is we have several problems, but the first one is the budget. I mean, there's budgetary issues. You, you know, the assumption is, and when you took it at that high level, it's real easy, we just move applications. Right. That's not the case. Everybody has a budget associated with the application. They have right. no idea what it costs to migrate. They have to palm us in the future. Mm -hmm. They have a contracting issue with their <coughs> provider, their system integrator that they're going to have to modify. And these, the system integrator, or it could be a small business or whatever, may not have any idea how to move anything to a cloud. So what do we do? Do we take a contract away from these people and say, hey, guess what? I'm going to give it to somebody else to do the migration or not. So we're into this budget estimation, contracting with the current contractor issue that you have to resolve before you move anything to a cloud. And that's taking up a lot of effort because all of a sudden you realize, hey, this is a lot of work. Right. This is a contracting issue work that hasn't been thought about before because we're modifying contracts or we're yeah. changing contracts. And besides that, then you have the reverse of this. As soon as you move something to the cloud, the SLA issue, the performance issue from the mission side is important. The question is, who's responsible for what SLA? Okay, the cloud provider has an SLA based on performance of their hardware suite. That's great. I have a system integrator that's actually maintaining the system per se. I have a network environment that's supposed to maintain mm -hmm. the connectivity. And so when you look at an SLA, of course, we want to look at an SLA from the user mission viewpoint, not from the cloud provider viewpoint. So the question becomes, who do we point at and say, who's in charge of this SLA? Right. And that's been an issue right now. Yeah, because ab absolutely. Absolutely. I can understand that one completely. And so we're kind of like playing with that one right now, too, as to what we want to do with it. Yeah. Uh, I want to hear from our industry panelists, too, on the same question, but we need to take another short break. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. I'm Jim Flyzik here with Frank Konechny from the U.S. Air Force, John Hale from DISA, Colonel Rodney Swan from the U.S. Army, Stacy Wynn from Forts Point, A.J. Laforte from BMC Software, and Doug Bourgeois from Deloitte Consulting. We're talking defense, cloud computing. When we went to break, we had heard from the government folks about some of the challenges they face. How about from the industry perspective? Stacy? when you look at some of the challenges that uh, you face when trying to support your customer base and in, in, in the cloud, what, what comes to mind? I think one of the big ones, in, in addition to everything everyone else has already mentioned, is the assessment and authorization process is very vital to all the work that we do to ensure you know, our risk management protocols are being followed and everything sure. else. However, it too needs to be modernized and, and sped up to meet the pace of cloud and meet all these modern technologies that we're having so that we can get patches out to the field yeah. faster Excellent to ensure point. all of that security. Excellent point. The uh, certification and accreditation processes and the authorities to operate, things like that, just take too long. I mean, you, it, it, you go through a generation of, uh, of computing just going through those processes sometimes. Right. Very good points. Doug Bourgeois, what, what are some of the challenges that you see uh, as you try to move forward to support your customer base in this area? I think, uh, I think by a substantial margin, the most uh, challenging uh, thing that the agencies are experiencing is the culture itself. 
Um, and, and this is a very substantial problem for agencies to overcome because you know, there's no silver bullet, you know, there's no right. magic formula for culture change. And I right. think, you know, many of the techniques that, you know, we've all learned through, you know, the, the, the real on-the-job training around leadership as well as, you know, our own more formalized training, uh, you know, do apply, but also it requires, you know, maybe some different approaches to leadership as well. All right. um, so I think that's a really important one. And it really, you know, requires a really sophisticated approach to change management. I think also, um, strategy and transformation in general. I think you know we've heard many of the panel, panel members talk about there's a technology component to this, there's a business model component to this, there's an acquisition component to this, and our core IT processes like Agile and DevOps and all those things. Um, that requires a really holistic approach, and, and it's not easy. Yeah. That, that's simply not easy. Um, and I think finally, is it in, in no small part because of cloud and other advancements in technology like IoT, uh, we're seeing that uh, agencies are, are basically drowning in data. Um, and I think there's, you know, there's an analytical kind of processing, you know, just dealing with the flood of information because of cloud, in the cloud, around the cloud, that's also presenting substantial challenges. And I think um, leveraging cloud platforms and some automation capabilities, agencies are getting better at turning those, uh, those analytics into insights for, that affect their mission. Fantastic. Doug, you're on a roll because this is uh, show 144, and uh, this is the 144th show that someone brought up culture as a challenge <laughs> every single show. So, I, the, uh, so what I take from that is you've listened to the 143 shows we have done in advance, so you knew that that was to be brought up here today. Uh, AJ Laforty, what do you think? Uh, anything you can add to the discussion here of uh, challenges that are... Uh, inherent in these programs. Yes, what, what we're starting to see uh, from our side of BMC is as the organizations are starting to merge together and trying to consolidate uh, their data centers into individual private clouds and consume the public clouds available to them, we're seeing a lot of issues with how the government's going to handle a chargeback on a by program level internal to uh, the government itself. So if one organization opts to be able to be the cloud hosting, cloud provider for uh, an individual agency, how do we handle the internal chargeback between right. different programs for them to be able to consume the cloud services in a centralized state? Um, because a lot of what was said earlier, the way the government spends money in IT and the way the government buys stuff in IT is I buy X and I get X, instead right. of having the ability to have the flexibility to be able to request and get exactly what I want when I need it and then get rid of it when I don't. Excellent, excellent. So this is just doesn't uh, call up Army, Navy, Air Force, say, hey, here's what you owe us, send us the money, and everyone says, okay, that's fine. <laughs> you know, obviously it kind of works that way. <laughs> um, uh, Stacy, <laughs> let's, let's shift to the future here a little bit, folks. Let's talk about where this is all going down the road. So uh, this is our opportunity for all of you to like put on, uh, look into your crystal ball and say, what's, what's cloud going to do? Due to our computing environment and infrastructure down the road, what's all going to look like? Stacy, what's it look like to you? What's the future look like? Well, I think one of the things we have to look at is how cloud is going to be able to help support the mobile environment. Okay. We can't get away from that um, just from a basic recruitment you know, feasibility, bringing people in. Millennials and the younger generations expect it's on my phone, where is it? I, I want that app now. So cloud's going to be able to support that, so we have to really look deeply at how we do that in a very Excellent. secure and planned manner. Very, very good point, very good point. Doug Bourgeois, what do you think uh, it looks like down the road? Where's this all going? What's, yep. gonna, what's it going to look like in the future? Looking at it from a kind of a vision perspective, you know, first of all, I really think it's not about the cloud at all. Um, I think it's, you know, cloud is, is an enabler for the government to transition to becoming truly digital organizations. And I think that's really, we've entered into the digital age and cloud is simply a mechanism, an enabler, a capability that helps with that. Um, leading adopters from the private sector like Netflix, uh, Facebook, Twitter, they've successfully established a digital DNA inherent to everything they do in their organizations. And I think the government has already started down this trend, might not fully realize that, uh, and cloud has kind of been a catalyst for driving that forward. So I think, uh, you know, um, 
it, it also is going to bring a convergence of cloud, DevOps, agile, social, mobile, and analytics all together, required together to successfully push to this truly digital age. And I think we've already started on it. It's just an early stage piece, but you know, a lot more, a lot more to come. I like it. I like it a lot. A lot of collaboration to be happening over the next several years. Colonel Swan, what's it look like to you down the road? Where's this all going? Well, I think as an as an end state, you know, the Army has to consider its core mission, right? So our core mission is to fight and win our nation's wars. Mm -hmm. And so, and mobility is one of those things that we really are very uh, concerned about, and, and we have to have mobility. We got to be able to deploy forces uh, in in a moment's notice to to places, and we have to have that mobility aspect, as, as Stacy mentioned. And it has to be secure, and it has to be in an austere environment at times, low bandwidth environment. But at the end of the day, what we want to do is we want to transform from the user owned to as a service. In other words, we want to decouple our uh, commands from the hardware. Uh, and allow them to use the cloud as a mobility platform to complete their mission so they can focus on their core competencies. Oh, okay. And uh, and so that's the that's the real vision. And and we gotta embrace all the services from the cloud. You know, the agility of the cloud, being able to have that mobility. And so that's our 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 end state and where we want to go. Yeah, it's a lot like uh, Doug brought up earlier his comment about it's about mission, not the That's technology. Right. You know, we want our we want people to focus on the mission and not worry about the technology. Uh, AJ Laforty, what do you think? Uh, what's this look like down the road to you? What's your crystal ball look like? I, I think moving forward here that what we're going to see is we're going to see the ability for DOD to provide XS or anything as a service to the consumers within DOD. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, what we're going to see is a consolidation and a removal of physical data centers inside of the DOD to maybe a few internal for a private cloud need and then a shift to the public cloud mm -hmm. to be able to host and scale um, the resources the DOD needs in the end to meet their mission. Uh, because as we know, things change on a daily basis. Sure. There could be a brand new mission that comes up tomorrow and now we need you know, 10,000 resources available for this and being able to have that available at a moment's notice. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, very good points. And, you know, and that trend seems to continue, you know, and the, back uh, when we first started cloud, people were looking at what are some of our administrative processes and then maybe email, things like that. Now we're bleeding into some mission oriented type things things that could, can move and I think over time, you know, as confidence grows and confidence with security grows and trust grows and culture issues begin to uh, evolve more, we'll see more and more things move that direction. Um, Frank Konechny, what do you think? Frank, what's, uh, what's this look like down the road? Where, where's it all going to you? I, I think the rest of the panelists kind of touched on it, but I think you're going to see more of an evolution of this. I mean, our mission so far has been moving applications to the cloud. That's mm -hmm. been the mission. Mm -hmm. However, that's not really the mission. I mean, but that's been our charter. You know, after CCI, we got to right. consolidate. So if I we got to Air Force and look at the mission statement on the Air Force. I bet I don't find move applications to the cloud no. anywhere in that mission statement. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> and but see, I think the, the trend is going to change now. We're going to look at clouds more as a capability, ubiquitous capability across the board, and so. But you have to look. But they have to change their viewpoint of how an application or how a service should be provided. Now, this is a it's main, it's a mind shift, sure. because now we're talking about using hybrid clouds, using the capability of the cloud, but keeping the data someplace else, having multiple clouds actually access the same data source, but doing different things on that data source. So this is a different change in how you run your mission, as opposed to anything else, and that hasn't been thought of before, because everything was in a data center someplace, and that was it, and you run it from that data center. But since the Air Force is worldwide, you have to think of it in terms of that way now, that maybe I can have multiple clouds accessing the same data source someplace else, and therefore they're all getting different information out, but they all need it for their particular mission. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent stuff. Yeah, it would be interesting sometime to have a discussion with you know, folks that have been in government or in, in DOD for a long period of time and now doing things different and just get their perspective, as opposed to the IT perspective, the program manage, the program perspective and the actual user base and how they have seen all this impacting their life and job and, and so forth. Very good points you brought up there, Frank. Uh, John Hale, what do you think in terms of uh, the future? What's this uh, look like to you down the road? Where are we all going with this? So, so DIS's mission is to provide services to 
our services mm -hmm. so that they can complete their mission, right? So our, we're really a support organization for, for these guys to complete their mission. So we work very closely. We listen to what they're trying to tell us uh, about what they need, uh, and we're trying to stay one step ahead of that. So. Uh, you know, f from a short-term perspective, we're doing the MillCloud 2.0 effort, which is our on-prem commercial cloud capability, much like what the Army's doing with their Red Zone effort. Uh, we're also working very closely with our, our mission partners for uh, what we call the secure cloud computing architecture, which is putting all the pieces I talked about earlier in place so that we can safely and securely leverage off-prem commercial cloud capabilities along with on-prem commercial cloud capabilities. Um, so that's kind of the short-term stuff. You know, if we go back to the long-term vision, and I, I kind of have to go where Stacy went with hers, you know, my, I personalize this, right? So my son is 15 years old, mm -hmm. uh, and, and in three years, he's going to be in my workforce. And my son has never known the world without the Internet. Right. My son has never known the world without data in his hand. He, right. he has, a, he ha you know, he has a, a mobile device. I don't want to say what particular brand it is, right. but he has a, a mobile device, and he lives in that world, right? He doesn't he doesn't know the world without things in his hand and email is something he does not use. Right. And so, you know, when you, you when you look at that culture and in 3 years he's going to be our warfighter. He's going to be our our my customer and uh, other than the fact that that scares me from a father's perspective, <laughs> um, you know, we have to put the things in place necessary yeah. for one word and that's agile to provide the information that they need to do their job in the future. Excellent and so point. everything that we're doing from a cloud perspective right now is about really building that agility into the ecosystem right. so that our mission partners can effectively complete their mission. Yeah, I'll tell so. you, every time I spend time with my grandkids, I have six of them now, and the oldest one is six. When I when they pick up the devices, it's un unbelievable what they can do on the devices. And uh, uh, yeah, a five-year-old <coughs> grandson comes in, grandpa, What's your password? I can't get on this computer. I, and I don't, you know, you, know and you, be, you just think this is the future, boy. I mean, you know, it's going to be a different world down the road. Let me try to do some summarizing here. <clears throat> uh, again, a lot of content. I take notes as we talk to try to uh, do my best to try to put the uh, the show in perspective. Uh, we heard a lot about progress. Uh, what a, a big thing I walked away with uh, on the progress discussion is cloud is happening. I mean, we're it, we're doing it. It's happening across government. It's happening everywhere. Um, I heard a lot about uh, collaboration and Pathfinder and, and that program being one as an example of progress. I heard about auto provisioning that's happening, things happening a lot faster. We heard about uh, a lot of lessons being learned um, at the Army that can be used in other uh, cloud <clears throat> programs and rethinking of the infrastructure is very important uh, a lot of progress in rethinking just what the infrastructure will be down the road specific programs we talked about the army logistics support and redstone and the fact that that's one that uh, is being up there we talked a lot about on-prem and off-prem um, and what, what's going to be done cloud on-prem what can be go off-prem I guess it was me who sees the evolution of, of things moving over time more off-prem as we gain confidence and trust and, and collaborate with one another. Uh, also, software as a service and security being uh, uh, big specific things that are, that are happening um, and, uh, and will continue to happen in, in, in a more agile fashion. Uh, on the, a lot of discussion on lessons learned. We had a lot of talk about the importance of doing an inventory and understanding your portfolio. A lot of discussion about the fact that we don't just want to move old stuff into a new way of handling it. We want to modernize as we go along. We want to rationalize, do away with things we don't need, perhaps consolidate things that we can consolidate, get, get rid of some of those old band-aid tools that perhaps we don't need anymore and go to some new technologies. Um, we we uh, talked about no lift and shift. I like that term. Um, it's a term that uh, makes a lot of sense uh, just by talking about it. Um, uh, we, we heard about success changes the culture. If you begin getting success, the culture change can come with it, and that's going to be, uh, we talked about one size doesn't fit all. There's going to be different things you got to do different ways. We talked in security about who owns the system and who is responsible for that security. Uh, I wrote down it's about the mission, not just the technology. I think that's an excellent, excellent anecdote and something that can be used. We talked about right-sizing the cloud, and we talked about shifting the IT business model uh, and how that's going to need to happen for cloud to really be where we want cloud to be. 
Challenges, in addition to the obvious with security, we heard about uh, the challenges associated with contracting. This is a new way of, of, of acquiring things. It requires new SLAs. It requires a new th thinking of the budget, new thinking about how contracts can be modified to support this. Um, we heard about uh, challenges with getting things accredited and certified in time and authority to operate. You know, the world's moving fast. And if that uh, certification and accreditation processes can't keep up, we're not going to be able to stay ahead of that curve to get uh, the modernization in place that needs to be there. Challenges, the word culture came out again, as, as did the word transformation and the importance there, as well as chargebacks. We talked in the future about cloud supporting uh, mobility. We talked about it being mission, not technology, and digital organizations. With that, I want to uh, thank our panelists for taking time from your busy schedules to come out and share your ideas with us. It was a great knowledge sharing session for all of us. I want to thank our sponsors, uh, without which we don't have a show, so thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, the good people here at Fed News Radio who always do such a good job uh, supporting us and helping us put this program on. And last but not least, and most importantly, I want to thank the listening audience that tunes in and listens to our show each month. You've been listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM.